thank you so much for being here this evening to help us honor our colleague and our friend, and maybe your teacher, um, John Armstrong. It's my privilege to introduce him tonight. John has been an English instructor here at ICC for 10 years. He earned his associate's degree from here, from ICC, his bachelor's degree from the University of North Alabama, and his master's degree from Mississippi State University. John's an integral part of our English department. He plays guitar with the English department band, the Inhumanities. For several years, he's been the main contact for instructors teaching developmental English classes. He's set up the lab portion of these courses, aided instructors in navigating it, and fielded questions about both courses. Currently, he's co-writing two textbooks for these two courses, and his experience in both is invaluable to the success of the books. I'm grateful for all of his hard work. He's also a popular and talented instructor. And tonight, his presentation, I Know I Can, Confidence and Success in the College Classroom, is informed by his experience with his own students and their success. So please welcome John Armstrong. Their whole lives are built around 
a certain set of incidences in their lives that led them to be where they are. They didn't wake up one day and decide, I'm good enough to come for president. It was years and years of building that, building that, moving forward. And, um, you know, all of us come to every situation in our life with a different level of confidence. And that confidence level is based on our experiences. I say to my students all the time that we are the sum of our experiences. We do not wake up one day and we're suddenly someone completely different. We are all the things that have led us to be who we are. Your confidence levels are exactly what all the experiences in your life led you to be. Now, I got Dr. Phil up here who is pretty much, you know, the status quo for confidence. And I actually stole this from his Twitter page. Probably should have cited that. I can deduct points. Um, yeah, but I mean, seriously, uh, if, if you have a strong, supportive family, that doesn't mean that you won't go to school and have some negative experiences there. If you have wonderful experiences in school, it doesn't mean you won't have negative experiences with your family. There are thousands, millions, billions, infinite number of variables that will play on your confidence. And you know, um, Dale Schunk here, who's one of the guys that I've uh, quoted several times along with Van Durek, uh, he says that self-confidence is an individual's collective self-perceptions that are formed through experiences with and interpretations of the environment and heavily influenced by reinforcements and evaluations by significant other persons. You don't need 21 pilots to tell you that we care what people think. It's the truth. You do. It doesn't matter how much you tell yourself, I don't care what people think about me. I'm just going to be me. Well, that's just it. You're being you because you care about what people think about you. Every decision you make is a social decision, and you do regard yourself by the way other people think. If you choose to go the opposite direction in society and, you know, I don't know, don't wear clothes to class or something like that, you're doing so because of the same social situations that will make somebody else want to dress nice and do whatever. We, we do care what people think, and the way people think about us, the way people show uh, their uh, receptions to us, that, well, that affects our confidence and affects who we are. Uh, okay, <clears throat> now I'm going to start getting technical. Uh, if you are a teacher, then you were beat over the head with Albert Bandura at some point in your life. He's a social psychologist, elementary, not elementary, but educational psychologist, who uh, pretty much coined the concept of self-efficacy. Now, self-efficacy is more like a refined and uh, more accurate uh, form of confidence. Now, confidence, you know, th that pretty much pertains to the entire self, uh, the self-concept model. But when it comes to self-efficacy, that is your ability to complete the task, how you feel about your own personal ability to complete a task. Okay? Uh, it, you know, it, he says, and I'll, I'll quote just so I'm right here, the conviction that one can successfully execute the behavior required to produce the desired outcomes. It's all about outcomes. You know, when your teacher gives you a, an assignment, all right, the teacher gives you a writing assignment to write in the class, a math problem to work, your brain automatically starts working out the statistics of how well you think you can actually do it. It's immediate, it's instant, that's the way it is. You immediately start to feel like how can I do this? And you know, uh, you don't have to work with kids very long to realize that kids with lower self-efficacy, the ones that just don't think they can do it, if you put a math problem in front of a child that doesn't think he can do that problem, he will look at that problem, and he will look at that problem, and he'll play with his pencil, and he'll lie down in a chair, and he'll get distracted because that's the way that kids are. And uh, as, as they get older, that doesn't really change much. The older we get, the more we evaluate our own abilities to complete things. So when you're in class and your teacher gives you an assignment, this is, very, this is subconscious. This is not something you think out loud. But you subconsciously start to consider if you can actually do it. You know, when I was approached to do this speech, I'll tell you, I knew in my outcome scenario, yeah, I can get the speech done. But uh, inside, I was nervous about it. You know, I still am nervous about it, honestly. But the thing is, when, when you feel that you can do something, most of the time, it'll get done. But if you feel that you can't do something, then it won't. 
And, and self-efficacy plays into our classroom environment for both students and teachers, and it plays into the major decisions that you make in your life because college is a very integral part of your life at this stage. You know, when you're 18 years old, the whole world is suddenly asking you to make decisions that you will have to commit to for the rest of your life. You know, your career becomes your identity. It becomes who you are. And so if we're saying you're 18, you're going to make a decision right now to be this thing for the rest of your life, you better have a pretty good confidence about what you're doing, right? All right. Now, I'm going to talk about this and the various aspects of it. You may have been one of those students, or you may have had a friend who never had to study at all, still made straight A's. Are you that person? You look back and you can say, I never did anything that class made A's, right? Or have you ever been aggravated at a friend? You look at your friend and you say, man, she never does anything, but she's always making A's in that class. Don't know how she does it. Well, that all boils down to self-efficacy. The way that we perceive our end goal, the way that we perceive our abilities to complete a goal uh, tie into this. So it says, from a self-efficacy perspective, the belief that one can effectively process information can convey a sense of personal control over learning outcomes, which further strengthens perceived self-efficacy for learning. In other words, if you're in a history class and you feel that you can make a good grade on the test without studying, chances are, well, I'm not saying you will, but there's a really good chance that if you really feel it, then you will do a much better job than if you don't. You know, there are people who are not going to study who have a low self-efficacy. They're going to they're gonna not study and they don't believe they can do it and they wind up failing. And then there are people who don't study and they have a high self-efficacy and they wind up doing a whole lot better just because they believe that they can. Makes a big difference. All right, let's talk about effort. Effort and ability. Now, this is kind of funny because uh, you would think that people would have really high self-efficacy that work real hard. And you would think that if, if you sit down and you work on your homework assignment, let's say you have this research paper you're doing in my class. Yeah, we're doing research papers. <clears throat> so if you're doing a research paper in my class and you work on it just day in, day out, all day long, and then you go up there and you make an A on it, well, good for you. But actually, your perception of your ability is not going to get any higher. But if you don't work on it, and you come in and you make a good grade anyway, all of a sudden you think you're really good at this stuff because you didn't try real hard. Now, this is, this is just one side of this, but um, you know, young children, and I think, yes, young children perceive, according to studies, that the more you work at something, the better you get. It's not until later that the concept of ability jumps out at people. People just simply say, I can or cannot do it. You know, every uh, English teacher I've ever known tells me they're not math people. You know, I, I've said it for years. I'm not a math person. That's, that's why I don't ever do good in math. That's why I didn't take math classes past 2002. That's why I, 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 I don't do math at all. Um, and then you've got other people who say, I just never was good at writing. Those sorts of expressions are expressions of ability. It's not saying if I put effort into this, I'll get better. It's just simply saying I don't have the ability to do it, therefore, not going to try. You know, you, you know you're guilty of telling yourself this for lots of different things. You know, what can you do versus what you can you not do? You believe in your mind, you have a set of parameters of things that you believe you can do and things you believe you cannot do. And that is all tied into the idea of self-efficacy, the, the uh, result of a lifetime of being told you can do this or you cannot do this. It comes from failure. It comes from success. It comes from negativity and positivity, all the things that bring you to who you are. So you believe, I cannot do this or I can do this. Now, what if you believe that? You come to my English class and you believe that you're not good at writing at all. You're probably not even going to put in the effort because what's it worth? If your ability isn't there in your mind, then what good is effort, right? All right. Now, this guy right here, I saw him on MTV. This is not Photoshop. This guy had implants right, in his biceps. People think he's weird. I, I don't know why. Uh, he says that they're real. He believes that they're real, but they're obviously not real. Um, this is an example, though, of what I was saying. If you have, if you put in minimal effort and get good grades, 
then you will be more confident in your abilities to do things, but you're not getting much out of it, right? If you put in maximum effort and you get good grades, you're going to have a slightly uh, a stalemate or lower self-efficacy. I know some of you are listening to me and you're wondering, are you telling my students not do anything? I'm not. I'm getting around to this. All right. So here's what happens. You have a high ability in your mind to do something. You put in minimum effort over lots of time. Inevitably, you run into a problem. Students come in all the time from high schools. And I'm not, not saying anything negative about high schools. We love our high schools. What I'm saying is they'll come in, and they have put in minimal effort in some classes. Then they show up to a college class, and we get in there, and we say, we're going to challenge you. And all of a sudden, they flop. They're not used to doing the effort. They're used to getting that efficacy reward because positive self-efficacy is a positive reward in our minds if we feel that we can do something feel we're good at something we want to maintain that feeling it feels good to us and if we haven't put in much effort well we wind up doing stuff like this when failure happens then people start making excuses you know well the teacher didn't like me or um I slept the whole time in that class. How many of you have ever told yourself, and I want you, you don't have to raise your hand or something, this is all, I don't, I don't, I don't care, but uh, how many of you have ever told yourself that I only failed that class because I didn't try? You ever told yourself that? That would be an example of an excuse based in your own self-efficacy. See, so you believed that you could have done better if you did try, but your effort didn't match your ability. The, the issue is that we have to find a middle ground between effort and um, efficacy. See, here's the deal. The bottom line is this. If you continue to put in the effort, your self-efficacy builds slowly. It doesn't jump up all at once. You work really, really, really hard on something, and you get an A, good for you. Next week, you've got to do it again. You dread it. You don't know if you can do it. It's too hard. You did it good last time. Guess you can do it again. You've got to do it again the next week. Over time, you put in the effort, you get the reward. If you don't put in the effort, you get a big reward at the beginning, and then all of a sudden, you know, you have a failure, you just want to quit. You want to run away, you want to give up. That is what happens so often to freshmen. Are you suffering with that? I mean, think about it. Since the beginning of school, how have your grades been? Have you, has it been harder than you expected it to be? Have you said at any point, well, I just don't get that class. The teacher doesn't like me. I'm not good at that. That's a defensive posture in saying that, you know, you're not used to putting in the amount of effort to receive that reward. Okay. This isn't just about students. I want you to sort of understand what it's like to be a teacher because this is something that no one seems to understand. We come into a classroom and there's this disconnect between students and teachers. Students sit down and look at us and think, oh, well, this is your role to fill. And we look at students and we think, oh, this is your role to fill. But the truth of the matter is that we are all just people. And whatever we bring into the classroom is something we started working on a long time ago. We bring our baggage in. Now, I know we're supposed not to. You know, in August, we leave all that at the door. All that emotional stuff, you know, you got kids at home driving you crazy, you got sick people in your family, um, you got a mortgage, all that. We leave all that outside the door in August. In October, we're bringing it in with us, though, all right, just so you're aware. And so, um, you know, but the thing about it is you're doing the same thing. You know, whatever's going on in your life, uh, whatever's uh, got you distracted, you're bringing it in with you. It's not that you're, like you're leaving it outside. You're the same person sitting in the classroom as you were before you walk into the classroom. We can't honestly expect you to suddenly shift into a new role uh, if you really don't want to, all right? So, <clears throat> teacher self-efficacy is not what you think it is. You know, you might think that it's, it's simply the idea that uh, the teacher should feel confident in his or her mastery of the course material, but that is not how we define it. Teacher self-efficacy is the idea that we, as teachers, feel confident that we can help you succeed. And uh, that is put on the plate all the time. Because, you know, if, if I'm in here and I'm thinking I'm going to help you succeed and i got a hundred of you 
looking at me. It's one thing if it was just one-on-one -on -one with, you know, two or three kids. But, you know, you might have 110, 120 students in a semester. And we feel that we have to help every single one of you succeed. And that can get overwhelming. It honestly can, considering with everything else that we got going on. And that leads to a well-documented condition called teacher burnout. This is a well-documented concept. Um, teacher burnout is when you just give up. I could say some more things, but you just give up. You just don't care because you've just been through too much. It's emotional exhaustion. Let me tell you something. I want you to be very, very understanding of me when I say this. The classroom is an emotional place because a, a building is just a building. Walls are just walls. It's not a classroom until we show up, and we are just balls of emotion. We show up, and, and there we are. I mean, you know, as a teacher, you get to walk in there. All right, let, let me just set this up. Um, you know, I, I can think of maybe one other job, like the state executioner, you know, the guy that does the lethal injections. I can think of, like, that guy and teachers are the only folks who are going to show up to work and just ruin somebody's day just by being there, you know? It's the truth, because... I can be, you know, I, I can have the worst time. My, my kids can throw up all over me, and I can be sick and, and, and just uh, having the worst time trying to get to school. I get to school at 8.03 in the morning after having fought off the devil himself to get there. And somebody in the classroom goes, oh, thank you. I mean, it's the truth. It, 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 you, you have to remember that we're people, people. We are we're getting a paycheck to show up to work, you know? And if you give us that response, well, that lowers our self-efficacy. It really does. Because we're going to react to that. We're going to react and say, oh, well, you don't care that I'm here. Oh, man, I just love when people try to talk me into leaving early. You know you can let us out early, right? So I've been told every day of my life by somebody, <clears throat> oldest one in the book, just so you know. But, yeah, we, we, we get... You know, we feel like we're doing a really good job. Feel like we're doing a really good job. And somebody plops a head down on a desk, goes to sleep. You know, people tell you from an early age, listen, pay attention, raise your hand, smile, ask questions. You know why that is? I mean, it ain't got nothing to do with you. It's got everything to do with the teacher. Because if you do those things, the teacher's going to feel better. Believe it or not, if you sleep in a class, all you're doing is making me feel like, ugh. I'm going to remember that, too. Come time to grade, yes. Yes, I'm going to remember your face or what part I saw of it. I'm going to remember that. Because negative stuff like that, it sticks out in your mind. It really does. What we look for is we look for the nonverbal compliments. Students and teachers both. We look for positive reinforcement. And, uh, yeah, if we don't get it, we get burnout. And burnout's hard to overcome. People have... Look, people have died of cardiovascular disease. Teachers, I'm talking about now. People have uh, retired prematurely. People just fight to escape the school system. I mean, if those of you who are uh, education majors, there are so many people who work hard, go through and get four-year degrees, and spend thousands of dollars and thousands of hours of their life to teach one year. They go in there, and no, <clears throat> going to go do something else. Just one year is all it takes because of that situation. It's a highly stressful, highly emotional environment. I mean, there have been plenty of times that you know you've heard a student insult a teacher in class. I mean, think about that. That's just a human being up there, you know, that's talking to you. And, and people will say the nastiest things. What if your teacher said that to you, you know? But anyway, let's move along. All right, I'm talking about the emotional classroom. Teachers with lower self-efficacy are probably going to be the ones that will plaster an F on your face faster than anybody else. I'm talking about, boom, you walk into the classroom, you say, I'm going to be on the president's list, I have an 89, can you give me one more point? Absolutely not. You know why that is? Because in, in the whole spiraling situation of self-efficacy, you haven't you haven't made that teacher want to do that for you, right? And also, you've got the, uh, the idea of total leniency. Total leniency. I don't care anymore. 
Uh, student walks in, like, I ain't done a thing this semester. Good for you. Here's your hundred. Leave. All right? This is something else that's associated with burnout. We would never want to do this or admit that we would ever do this. But it's, it's something that, that we should not, you know, do. But it's the result of too much emotional baggage. All right. So, lower self-efficacy equals job stress. Job stress equals I don't want to come to work. Leave me alone. That's burnout. All right. <clears throat> now, we said all that to say that we should all want to improve our self-efficacy, right? We all want to feel like we can do stuff. I mean, when you were a kid, you probably said, I want to be an astronaut. Somewhere around your senior year, you're like, no, not going to do that. Why? What changed? What changed is your perception of ability. It's not the, the amount of effort you put in. It's your perception of whether or not you can do it, you know? And I don't want you to think that confidence and arrogance are the same thing. Arrogance is when you foolishly believe that you can do things that you can't do. I mean, in that case, that's still better than believing you can't do anything. But um, the, the idea of increasing self FC begins with awareness. If you are aware of every time you tell yourself, I can't do something, if you're aware of every time you look in the mirror and say you're not good enough or that you don't have the ability or anything like that, then you realize that the number one thing holding you back from success in the classroom, in anything, is invariably yourself. And the same thing goes with teachers. If a teacher walks into a classroom and says, I can't help these kids, well, then you've just made a declaration of low self-efficacy. You can't do it. Probably won't do it because you just said you can't do it. See, that, 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 that's it. We tell ourselves what we believe. We establish our core principles and we say them out loud. We say them to people. We walk around and say, I wasn't any good at that. I'm not any good at that. That never was for me. I can't do that right there. Why not? You know, Because you no longer see the world as effort. You see it as ability. No matter how hard you try in your mind, you'll never be able to do that. And so we have to get out of that frame of thinking. Because otherwise, we do stifle ourselves. All right. <clears throat> now, coping skills. Let me tell you something about compliments. Compliments don't have to be verbal. You don't have to look at somebody and say, I like your face, for it to be a compliment. You can do better than that. You can compliment people with nonverbal communication all the time. A smile, a wave. You know that laughing at somebody is a compliment? Are you the kind of person, not laughing at, sorry, laughing at someone's joke is a compliment. Are you the kind of person that just, you think you're a hard sell? Somebody comes up to you and tells a joke, and you just look at them like, no, not funny. Don't like it. All you're doing is withholding a compliment. That's all you're doing. You're just looking at that person and I'm not going to give you the benefit of that. No. So, if, you know, your teacher comes into class and tells a joke, you know, and you think it's funny, but no, I ain't going to laugh. Not that. Mm -mm. I ain't going to laugh at that guy. All you're doing is withholding a compliment. That's all you're doing. And if your student comes in, and your student comes in and, and tries to entertain you, tries to talk to you, tries to do the things, tries something new on a writing assignment, tries something new in math or something like that, and because that student is trying to build on something that you've said, that's a compliment. You know, raising a hand in class and asking a question is a compliment. Looking up and smiling is a compliment. Taking notes is a compliment. All those things that show engagement, they're not just for you. They're for bettering the entire classroom environment. Right? So, <clears throat> we have to establish better coping skills with our personal emotions. You know, um, when you're in a class that you feel like you can't do, because let's, let's say, and I'm going to throw this out there, I was really nervous about college algebra, because when I was in high school, I didn't do well in math, told myself pretty quickly I didn't like math, didn't want to do math. Went to math, every time I was in a math class, I felt just a little overwhelmed. Right? And so the whole time I was in there, and I had Miss, Miss Stembridge, who is really awesome. The whole time I was in there, she talked to me. She complimented me. Uh, she made me feel like I could do it, you know? And it made a huge difference. Now, I'm not saying my self-efficacy jumped up a mile, but I, I, I was able to feel confident enough in my outcome ability to finish the class with a decent grade. And, you know, again, it wasn't enough to make me want to change my major and go major in math. But it was just enough to help me get through it. All right. 
Um, and this is one other little side note that I include today. And this is about interest. And this, this is scholarly. I didn't make this up. Interest is incredibly important. You have to be interested in something to learn it. You have to be interested in something to feel like you're good at it. Self-efficacy and interest are perfectly closely tied together. In other words, the better you feel that you are at something, the more interested you are in it. And that is a given. Let's say you want to play guitar. Anybody bought a guitar before? Just about everybody buys a guitar at some point. And then um, <clears throat> about a fourth of people who buy a guitar actually learn to play guitar. And, and what that amounts to is your level of interest. If you sit down with that guitar and it's difficult and it hurts your fingers and you don't like doing it, then after a while you lose interest because you don't feel like you're good at it. See, that's self-efficacy and the impact on interest. But if you have friends that play guitar and you have a band that you really love to listen to and you find that to be interesting, you will plow through that that low self-efficacy until you're good at it. And then you will be good at it and you'll be interested in it. So what I'm saying is this, and by the way, there are two kinds of interest, personal and situational. Personal is what you bring with you all the time. Your personal interest. You know, if you like basketball, baseball, whatever, you've built that up into your life where you are interested in, in, interested in that subject really, really well. But situational is when you sit down with something in a moment and you see if you can be interested in it, like a math problem. You know, most people would say, I'm not really interested. I'm going to say most. I, I apologize. Um, most of my English friends would probably say, I'm not really interested in doing a math problem. But if you can do it, if you're good at it, that's completely different. You feel like you can do it. You're more interested in doing it. So um, what we have to do, believe it or not, is feign interest. You know what I'm talking about? When you're sitting in history class and you really don't care, I'm not, no, no offense to our history teachers, I love history, but, you know, there are going to be some students in this room that, that you really don't care, all right? Now, you have a degree to obtain at some point, but right now all these dates are flying by your head and you just really don't care. Well, can you make yourself be interested? It, it, it takes work. It takes work. It takes effort. But if you sit there and make yourself be interested, you're going to do a lot. Not only are you going to eventually boost your own self-efficacy toward that subject, your attentiveness in the class, your desire to learn will boost the teacher's self-efficacy toward teaching you as a student. So you're going to get more out of that class no matter what happens. All right. Now this may come as a shock to you, but if you're between the ages of 18 and 25, your emotional intelligence is about half developed, all right? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the emotional intelligence doesn't stop developing until you're about 30 years old. It's difficult for an 18-year-old to make an emotionally charged decision. It's much easier on older people because our prefrontal cortexes are more developed. It's just a given. I may still be developing mine. I'm not sure. I haven't checked lately. But the thing is that if you, um, if you have to make these emotional decisions, your teacher gets on to you in class you forget to do your homework, you do things wrong, then you will probably react negatively. You'll probably want to, you know, go inward or, or react emotionally or something like that. That's because it's just more difficult. It is. It's just generally more difficult. If you take a non-traditional student, uh, most non-traditional students, in my opinion, seem to be more level-headed. They come in and, and they, they, they do the work and they don't, they don't have high self-efficacy but they have a better emotional intelligence, better coping skills. So if you're aware that maybe perhaps you are not coping well with the emotions associated with your class, then you can make changes. Awareness is very important. Okay, self-efficacy in a classroom is a big circle. Teachers have to feel like they're doing a good job. Students have to feel like they're learning something and they're engaged. Everybody has to work together. It's not a one-sided uh, show. Teachers can't get up in front of students and put on a show for a disinterested crowd that is eventually going to just, you know, walk out because that's going to make the teacher feel like he or she's not doing a good job. And the student's not going to feel like he or she's doing a good job. The teacher is not interested in, in, and doesn't seem interested in helping. So, compliment. Show interest in the subject material, even if you have to fake it. Uh, ask questions. Don't fall asleep. Make eye contact. Take notes. And teachers really have to try to shed those emotional baggage and burdens outside of the classroom. 
Because we do, we bring them in. Uh, we have to compliment our students. We have to be positive. We have to be stern, but we have to be positive. We have to make, make it feel like this is something that's working and we're learning from it. Okay, so I wrote this. You can quote me on it. <clears throat> better emotional awareness will lead to better self-efficacy of both teachers and students. Better self-efficacy will lead to more student success and for teachers, more fulfilling careers. We don't want to be stressed. We don't want to have drama in the classroom. You don't want to fail classes. You don't want to do poorly on exams. We all want the same thing, and that is for you to succeed and for us just to be happy in our jobs. So in order for that to happen, we have to work together. Remember, it's not a one-sided show. If you're a student, you have to walk in there and you have to try. And if you're a teacher, you're not just up there talking to a bunch of, you know, non-human people. We're all people and we have to remember that. There's my work side. You can grade me on that later. Okay. <laughs> well, folks, I think that's it. Thank you. Fantastic job, and whether you know it or not, you will be doing a professional development called No Drama in the Classroom. Already decided. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. It is my pleasure to introduce Miss Caroline Gillespie, um, our representative from the Mississippi Humanities Council program. Caroline is originally from Oxford, Mississippi. She has been with the Mississippi Humanities Council since 2014 and serves as the MHC's program officer. As program officer, Caroline develops and implements council educated programming such as the New Ideas on Tap Happy Hour program and coordinates the council's statewide family literacy project. Please come forward and hopefully you'll. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for having me out tonight. Um, we do over 30 of these each fall for all of the colleges and universities around the state. And while they're all great, some are uh, more enjoyable than others. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, the Mississippi Humanities Council is really pleased to honor John Armstrong tonight here at Itawamba Community College. Um, like I said, every year we recognize um, a humanities teacher award winner at each of our colleges at each of our state's colleges and universities. Um, and as part of this award, all of our winners um, are asked to present a lecture on a humanities-related subject, and they'll receive a cash award as well as a free ticket to our annual award ceremony um, that will be in February in Jackson, where they will be publicly recognized for their achievement. At the Humanities Council, we believe it's important to recognize the excellence of humanities teachers while also encouraging their work as scholars. Um, so the purpose of this lecture and the other presentations taking place in 30 other colleges across the state this month is to bring the insights of humanities scholars to the larger public. This idea of enabling and encouraging humanities scholars to reach beyond academia to bring their work to the community has always been central to the mission of the Humanities Council, where we believe that the humanities are for everyone. The Council's an independent nonprofit supported my, primarily through the National Endowment for the Humanities and also by grants and donations from private foundations, corporations, and individuals. In turn, we support a wide range of public humanities programs throughout the state. Uh, so we invite you all to join us in this work, and you can visit our website, mshumanities.org, or follow us on Facebook to learn more about us. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Congratulations. Again, help me congratulate Ms. Armstrong. Do you want to say a few words? Um, I, I like money, so this is nice. Um, thank y'all so much. This is a huge honor. And uh, yeah, I don't even know what to say. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us for reception out in the lobby. Thank you.